Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this very important and critical podcast. We have been long anticipating this fine gentleman to be on our uh, podcast for many months. Uh, we were anticipating having him earlier this March, but God re-circumvented and navigated the timing for such a time as this, and he's been gracious enough to join us. And we have the one and only Mr. Lloyd Brunson joining us today. Uh, he's going to be talking about everything regarding his case, where it stands in the Supreme Court, and some other initiatives that he's working to further the betterment of, of God's people, mankind, and the constitutional upholding that we all hold so dear. If you are new to the podcast, please do like, subscribe, and share as it helps the channel grow. I'm going to read his bio since he's a first-time guest, and he's given it to me in the most accurate version, so I pray I do it justice. And it is simply this. Lloyd Brunson is the only pro se plaintiff ever in U.S. history allowed under U.S. Supreme Court's Rule 11 to bypass the normally required circuit court with his appeal filed by the Supreme Court of the United States as one of, quote, imperative public importance, end quote. Lloyd is the author of the pocket-sized book called or titled The Constitution of the United States of America for Federal, State, and Local Officials, highlighting power clauses that expose the Federal Reserve System, absolute immunity claimed by government officials that violate the binding oath requirements within our Constitution, and much more. And we'll leave his links in the description at the end. You can get these at, at, available at 7, the number 7, discoveries.com, LloydBrunson.com, and KidsSaveUSA.com. All that said, Lloyd, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? It's great to be here. I'm doing all right. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for the invite. Oh, it's an honor. Believe me, we've been in long anticipating you. Did I read your bio? Okay. Was that accurate? Yeah, it was good. <laughs> okay, good. So I'm going to hit you right away, Lloyd, for the sake of time with the first question, the one that I think is imperative on my mind and everybody's minds. Obviously, we kind of touched on it. And it's simply this. As you know, many people are interested in pining for information concerning your pending case in the Supreme Court that would ostensibly decertify the 2020 election. Now, there are a lot of rumors been swirling around saying that you won or lost or nothing's happening. We have you here as the horse's mouth, so we would simply like to know the, reaction, the actual reality of the situation, and why are you encouraged not only for your case to be heard, but why do you feel President Trump will win this critical election, or will we even have an election? Well, those are some pretty good questions. First of all, the, the Brunson case is not about the outcome of the election. It's not about overturning the election. It's about removing a security breach with 388 defendants that would have a dramatic effect, including canceling the credentials of some executive branch members, including Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, and over 300 others uh, congressional members. So because they did not pause for a simple 10-day investigation that Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, and others wanted them to pause and investigate, they refused to do it. And look at the mess we're in today because they didn't investigate. So, and as, what was the other question about Donald Trump? Well, yeah. I, I, hope, I, I hope I we, we're all hoping that the election uh, process will be secure enough that will allow uh, him to win. But uh, no matter what, we know that it's an unfair election, as it was the last time he he lost. He really didn't lose because of the wow. Federal Elections Commission rules completely being broken by allowing the mainstream media press act as an arm of the of the opposition. And so that's a violation of federal election commission uh, laws that they're supposed to enforce. And so just on that point alone, we know it wasn't a fair election. So we're hoping and praying that God will have mercy on us, that we'll have another chance to really embrace the Constitution. And the reason we're in this awful mess really is because of our ignorance to the power in the Constitution that would have kept this from happening. And it all started with uh, the Constitution being signed, Article 1, Section 8 gave the Congress the power to raise money and to fund constitutional education. It's called the Militia Clause in Article 1, Section 8, that gives the Congress the power to discipline the militia for the purpose of enforcing the laws of the Union. Discipline is education. Laws of the Union is the Constitution of the United States. We know the Congress was the first organization to publish the Bible in the United States of America, well, they were also supposed to fund constitutional education. Now, Thomas Jefferson was very clear when he said the true corrective for constitutional abuse is education. And that's where we failed right at the beginning. A lot of people don't realize that. We need to get back to that. And Congress can fund constitutional education, and they've never done it. What gives you, yeah, thank you for that. It's a good summation. Um, 
other than your faith in the Lord and your experience, as you said, you know, dealing with Supreme Court, what are you seeing as signs from your purview that give you uh, encouragement about where we're headed? Well, uh, as far as the Supreme Court case goes, there are two very important parts to that. One is the justices have access to the petition, which under Rule 11, they can completely initiate, execute, adjudicate the full underlying complaint. So that's very important. But just as important as that, if not more, is public awareness. We're still working on that. We still have the letter campaign going. Uh, last August 19th, 2023, President Trump came on board, supported the letter campaign. People need to go to LloydBrunson.com and look at that video and look at what the petition is and sign it to support the Supreme Court and to together become more aware. Now, that petition, you can get a copy of that, perfect bound, exactly what the justices are reviewing. And that is really an expose on the Constitution and the oath of office. And one of the most important messages in that, which everyone really should read, is the fact that Article 6 of the Constitution is very clear that demands their oath be binding. The words are, they shall be bound by oath to this Constitution. And the U.S. attorneys all the way through have been fighting, defending their defendants with absolute immunity defenses. And it's just nonsense. How can you have a binding oath and then have them hide behind absolute immunity? So it's about awareness. Now, the highest court really is... Uh, with the people. It's the, you know, we know the, the court of public opinion. So as enough people become aware of this case and million, many people don't even know about it. Once they become aware of it and see that it's really about the oath being binding and they're, and they've given themselves absolute immunity as that grows. So does the support that the Supreme court, I believe needs to really take action in meaningful ways. And there are a lot of different levels of actions that they could take. Now, a lot of people also do not realize that when the Supreme Court has a petition that arrives, has an appeal from the lower court that arrives and they deny a hearing, even though they deny hearings, even twice, they can take it off the shelf even years later and completely adjudicate the whole case. Mm -hmm. And so they have that power. We don't know what they're doing. I haven't signed an NDA. There's a lot of rumors out there saying, suggesting that I have, and I haven't. And uh, they absolutely have the power to adjudicate it in any way that they choose at the moment they feel is correct. Now, we can speculate and think, well, maybe uh, this coming election is going to have something to do with action from the Supreme Court. If Trump wins, uh, he's a bigger supporter of the Constitution, obviously, than the than the opposition. And so if that's the case, maybe the Supreme Court would take less of an action. I'm just speculating here. Sure. I don't know if. If it's a different uh, result or if things happen that increase the emergency nature of the condition of this country, which it is pretty high level emergency right now, then action could be taken. But more powerful than that is once the public becomes aware of it, the Supreme Court is the servant of the people and they have an obligation to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that's what the Brunson case is all about. It's about defending the Constitution, upholding the binding oath. And they know that they've taken an oath and they have to do everything they can in their power at the most at the most perfect time to do it, which would, ha which would have the, the greatest positive effect on fulfilling their oath to the Constitution. So we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes of the Supreme Court justices, but we know that the Supreme Court, at least one of the justices, had to approve uh, the, the, the filing of the first Rule 11 uh, appeal to the Supreme Court that's ever been allowed to be filed from a pro se litigant, someone representing themselves. And the last time was the uh, Rule 11 was filed was before any of the justices were justices, and it was in the 70s by the U.S. government. And this is the first time in the history of the court, as you read from that, that little outline there, this is the first time ever that the Supreme Court has filed a, a Rule 11 uh, from a pro se litigant. Yeah, that's a lot to unpack in what you said there. And that's why I wanted to get it from you to separate fact from fiction. Um, a couple of things I find interesting, Loy, inside of what you said or subtopics is we're meeting today on Rosh Hashanah, which has more meaningful impact than I think people realize from a faith perspective. Two weeks from now, as you were, I'm just giving the audiences for posterity. October 17th, the Supreme Court re-deliberates on cases. They come back in. 
Uh, it'd be interesting to see if they hear your case as a shadow case. And that, that's me just speculating. But just the timing of us meeting now this month could not be better for everything, as you said. And I did go to your site back when I thought we were going to interview in March. And you, it was very reasonable. So I think like two bucks or something you could contribute and get on the list and sign the petition. So I encourage people to do that because it's a way for people in our audience to get actively involved, have some skin in the game. Uh, the more that we synergize as a community, as a nation, as a society collectively, the more we can stand up against this tyrannical deep state and, and really we the people. It, it could, this could not be a more important election on so many fronts, as you rightly said. So Good. we're praying for you. We're rooting for you. And, and obviously we're rooting for God's justice to prevail. So thank you for all that you're doing in the cause. Thank you. Sure. Another subject that I know is near and dear to your heart is seeing us return to a constitutional republic and as a result, return to the gold standard as an example of sound money. Do you believe President Trump, when he wins, will make this happen? Or is there another path that you see to making this a reality? Well, there's a YouTube video with me talking to him about that very thing. And that's what I address, address in my book is uh, constitutional money. I had a conversation with Stephen Moore. He was chief economics advisor for President Trump for four years. And, uh, and I said, to really simplify, to make a point, if the Federal Reserve System was successfully audited and their nonprofit status was successfully enforced, their nonprofit status, that means every trillion they create is profit for the treasury, not for their pockets. And if that were enforced, they would have to return more wealth than what the federal debt is, actually more wealth than what the federal liability is. Tucker Carlson, before he was fired, he, made, he posed a question. He said, if trillion dollars is when a trillion dollars is created out of thin air, why are we being taxed for it? According to their bylaws, according to the to the laws of 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 the of the United States of America, the Federal Reserve, when they create a trillion dollars, it's supposed to be a trillion dollars of profit for the Treasury, not tax debt for its citizens. So think about that. So in order to really get to the bottom of and correct the the uh, the currency problem that we have in, in America and the United States, we need to understand that first and get that taken care of. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was just letting you go run through that. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see. And another thing I, I was thinking about, Loy, is, you know, once President Trump is, you know, back in optically, um, he tried in his first term, as you recall, to get Judy Shelton in. And I think that was sort of a litmus test to see what would happen when he comes back. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking another pathway, Loy, to get your take on it is that once he's back in, I think he's he's going to have less obstacles in Congress and the Senate because he's going to be have a consensus. You know what I mean? And well, as a, he has some global powers too to deal with as well, because we're talking yeah. about a huge amount of wealth that needs to be returned to taxpayers. 100%. A tremendous amount of wealth. We're not just talking money; we're talking real assets. So yeah. that's really difficult. And then we talk about getting back to uh, the way it was, or getting back to the Constitution. We've really been off course for quite. From the beginning, we've been off course, and it was because of the bankers that were owning and buying up politicians. So when we think about uh, uh, how politicians have been bought and paid for since the beginning, and then the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, and it's, this is all addressed in my little book here, it's, mm. it's, a, it's a difficult pill to swallow. But once we understand that point, that a trillion dollars out of thin air, all the trillions that have been created are really supposed to be profit for the Treasury and not tax debt for us, That's then right. we can begin to understand the core problem. We're sending politicians to Washington, D.C. to mop up a flood, and none of them are, are, are <laughs> turning the valve off. So we continue to have this rush of a flood, like a flooded basement, they're going in with mops and no one has gone in and said, hey, we need to shut this valve off. Ron Paul has kind of scratched the surface with that and a few others. But I think President Trump has an understanding and has some information enough to maybe expose this and just exposing the Federal Reserve System's nonprofit status would be a big game changer. 100%. And, and to your point earlier, Loy, I mean, it's really, to me, in my mind, it's wealth, profits, and justice, for wealth, freedom, and justice, all, we could say, arguably intertwined, that are going to be returned as a result of this, yeah. this uh, groundswell, if you will, or just right cycling of things. So, yeah. We're, tax, we're, returns. tax returns are in order, huge ones. Oh, yeah. 
big time. Um, I also understand that you have some type of foundation or initiative in order to help ch children dream bigger and think more dynamically. Uh, can you talk about this initiative you have, the contest, how it works and how it started? Yeah, it's Kids Save USA, and we just did our first uh, live event on the 21st of September, which was Constitution Week, and it's called Kids Save USA Contest. And we were saying kids between the ages of four to 104 could actually <laughs> enter, and in 10 seconds, tell us what you would do. In 10 seconds, say or sing what you would do if you were president. Maybe before the end of the show, you can be thinking about that. Maybe give us give us your 10 seconds. So it was really great. Kids love to get engaged. And what better way to engage them in the Constitution than to give them the vision of someday they could, they could be president and name something that they would do if they were president. Now, the next question after that would be, okay, now show us the enumerated power that gives you the authority to take that action. And so now it drives them to study Article 2, right? The executive powers and the enumerated powers in the Constitution. So right there, we've accomplished the first step. And the second step is for them to realize that it's enumerated powers that give authority to our government. It's The Constitution isn't, if it's not it isn't a restriction where if it's not restricted, they can go ahead and do it. So once people understand that, that you can't do it legally if it's not an enumerated power in the Constitution as a member of Congress or the executive branch or any of the three branches. And once they understand that, it's a big leap towards understanding more. And it's a big motivational drive to get into the document so that they can come up with better answers as to what they would do and what the power would be to do it. And so it's exciting to see kids get excited mm -hmm. about interacting with something that can drive not just children, but adults to the document so they can start studying to see the power they're on. Now, my little book that is mentioned in my bio is this incredible, well, I have incredible discoveries that have never been publicized before. That's my claim that have never been talked about before. And I can mention a couple of those if you want to see what Please. those are. But just as an example, if you look at a pocket constitution in the footnotes, you'll see that certain amendments change certain parts of the constitution. Mm. But the first 10 amendments, you can't find a document anywhere that shows that the first 10 amendments amended any clause within the constitution. So it's like, did they not do that? Well, I say, yes, my book shows some of those power changes that happened. The first 10 amendments we 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 have been told are the Bill of Rights, you know, and a lot of people are asked, like on campuses, you see these TV shows saying, what are the first 10 amendments called? And they say, well, we don't know. And it's like, they're the Bill of Rights. Well, the Continental Congress did not define the first 10 amendments as the Bill of Rights. That's not how they were defined. And the documents show us that and the Continental Congress defined the first 10 amendments as more powerful than that. And you can't enumerate our rights anyway in a bill of rights. So the true definition of the first 10 amendments is further declaratory and restrictive clauses to the seven articles. So mm. they're an extension. They're like an addendum. They are a true addendum to the original seven articles of the constitution. Wow. And if you look at that, those first 10 amendments, the constitution was not even signed on by Rhode Island until those were in place. And hmm. those amendments have some powerful game changing uh, concepts in them and powers in them that you can see in my book. Now, one of one of the one of those power clauses that I claim is very important to understand is that there is an interpretation clause in one of those power clauses that demands the Constitution only be interpreted in ways that protect our God given unalienable rights. It demands strict interpretation. What a genius part of a contract to have like a mission statement demanding that the constitution only be interpreted in ways that support the purpose of the document and in mm. this case the purpose of the constitution is to protect our god-given unalienable rights and that ninth amendment is just one sentence and it goes like this you know what it is the enumeration in the constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people in mm. other words no interpretation that violates that, that disparage, that can be used to disparage or violate our rights is a legal uh, understanding or definition or comprehension of the, or interpretation of the document. In other words, no interpreting the constitution in ways that disparage or deny us our rights 
is allowed, is legal. It's not a legal uh, way to interpret the documents. So to have that Ninth Amendment is absolutely powerful. And no one has ever talked that way before. They've never mentioned it in that light before. And then there's another one. The last line of the fifth is very clear. It is the pow most powerful clause that not only defines socialism, but prohibits it. Nor shall your private property be taken for public use, which includes your money, be mm -hmm. taken for public use without just compensation. So that's a power clause, too, that we've that has been intentionally hidden from us. Now, that can also be interpreted as taxation. Isn't yeah. taxation having your private property taken from you for public use mm -hmm. without just compensation? Well, it certainly is. So what's the answer to that? The answer is in this book, and it, the answer is in the Constitution. And it goes back to Tucker Carlson's question, when a trillion dollars is created out of thin air, that's supposed to be pure profit for the Federal Reserve System, for the United States Treasury. The Federal Reserve System is only supposed to keep their operating expenses and every bit of money that they create beyond that is supposed to be profit for the Treasury. And in a, in a congressional hearing, you can see that they created $9 trillion within an eight-month period and distributed to foreign entities that they refuse to identify in a congressional hearing. So that's the big gusher. We've got to understand the Federal Reserve and money and find out why and stop them creating trillions of dollars distributing apparently to our enemies and stop that, shut that valve off and return the assets that they've created with that ill-gotten money, violating their nonprofit, return those assets to the taxpayers. Almost like our forefathers were brilliant deists. Who knew? <laughs> I'm more brilliant, I think, than they understood. If yeah, you look at yeah. it, if you, once you read the document in this light, understanding that, you see it's like a chess match. There were some founders that were against the other founders, but right won. Truth won. And the only way the bad guys are winning is by keeping those power clauses from being understood and from taking all of the money that's created as their profit instead of returning it to the treasury where it belongs. Yep. And you're absolutely right, because we've covered this with other guests about taxation being theft, because it shows you clearly in the Constitution, there's no law that says individuals have to pay taxes and property taxes. There's no law that says you actually have to file a deed with the city or municipality where you live. People just right. do it because they think they're supposed to. It's, you know, yeah, so no, I'm not telling people to stop paying taxes or to get in a right. fight with the IRS. That's not my message. But we need to no. wake up. And once we understand that trillions of dollars have been created and distributed and the tremendous amount of wealth. That would re that would be a huge windfall for the taxpayer and a huge windfall for this country. Real assets. It's not just money. We're talking about real valuable assets that are into the many trillions of dollars value throughout the world. Yeah. I mean, it's not about tax advice so much. Well, I, I get your point. But if, but if people know what their constitutional rights are, which I know you're all about imbuing them with that, then yeah. they can make an informed, discernmental, godly decision about, you know, what they should or shouldn't do. At least they'll be armed with the right sure. knowledge that they weren't potentially where well, before who, who they can who, vote for who they can support to run could, for office absolutely yeah, and, and what they what they do not what they say as you would agree yeah. um so finally uh last question for today before i answer your question about the 10 second uh con 10 second presidential pitch um you have an online presence whereby people can get your books online petition the supreme court in order to rally your case the supreme court can get the proper justice exact in order to right the wrongs can you share those details with our audience as we'll also leave that in the link in the description. Sure. The, if you go to lloydbrunson.com, you can actually sign a letter. It's your letter to the Supreme Court that we prepared and you can add words to it. If you'd like, you can download it and print it out yourself and mail it to the Supreme Court. But if you'd like, you can just click and sign your name to it. And then it uh, actually goes to a fulfillment company that prints it, folds it, puts it in an envelope, and sends it to the Supreme Court. Well over 90,000 people have written letters to the Supreme Court. And believe me, they know about those letters. That makes Good. a big difference. The goal is to get a million plus. And if we get millions of letters to the Supreme Court, it's like game over. America just waking up to the fact that they have a binding oath and they've been hiding behind absolute immunity. And that's one of the messages of this letter. It's game over. So we're talking once the masses just Find an opportunity that's available at LloydBrunson.com and take advantage of that. It's a huge push towards a constitutionally uh, sound government. So they can do that. Or like I said, they can download it and, and print it out themselves and mail it off to the Supreme Court themselves. Absolutely. 
Um, so I'll ask you the same question in a minute that you asked me. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. It's 10 second presidential pitch if I were president. My first goal would be to fully return the wealth transfer to God's giving people. That's the backbone of our channel. Return the constitutional freedom and rights of every natural American. Restore English as the national language, borders and security, and love one another regardless of age, gender, or background. That's beautiful. I think he came in about 9.9 .9 seconds. So that's great. <laughs> Lucky that's guess. Great. What about yeah. you? What's your 10 second pitch? Well, I think my favorite one is Article 1, Section 8, the power to educate America on the Constitution to enforce it. And uh, I would I would do whatever I could to start a great education course in America for the Constitution. Well, I think you're well on your way and, and we really appreciate it. Uh, and then let me mention, thank please. you. And then let me mention sevendiscoveries.com. You can get an actual petition. It looks like this. It's perfect bound. They like it to be perfect bound like a book. I have had several printed, so I'd have extras for people that would want to get them and uh, get one of those at sevendiscoveries.com. And we have some uh, the constitution book also that I talked about at sevendiscoveries.com. And if there are groups out there that want quite a few, they can send me an email Lloyd Brunson at gmail.com and I can work something out so that they can get a bunch of copies for a group. Excellent. I cut you off. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we're going to, we're going to get on that. People get onto his site and we got to raise those petitions up. So the Supreme court is forced to deal with it and they can't ignore it. Lloyd Brunson, thanks for being on our podcast. We would long anticipating this. We'd love to have you again, maybe uh, next month as we near the election cycle. And thank you again for your tireless efforts. God bless and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Same to you, John and your followers. Thank you. Thank you.